Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season we'll be discussing the early councils of the Church and how doctrine developed in those early times. Officially, there have been 21 ecumenical councils in Church history, but I think the first 10 will be enough for this season. Today, we'll be discussing the seventh official ecumenical council, the Second Council of Nicaea. As with the Sixth Council, this one took place over a hundred years after the council before it, and again, it was because another heresy needed to be dealt with. The iconoclasts in the eastern lands, still mainly controlled by the Roman Empire, had appeared, probably due to influence from the early Muslims who also surfaced in the area, and who, like the iconoclasts, considered making or keeping images of holy people to be horribly sinful. Of course, it didn't really get bad until the emperor himself became an iconoclast, and then persecutions began. There were multiple iconoclast emperors, with some being absolutely brutal to those who held on to and revered holy icons, but not all of them were, and one, Emperor Leo IV, was very lax in his enforcement of iconoclasm until the day he died, leaving behind a son, Constantine VI, who was too young to take the throne. Instead, his mother Irene began to wield authority in the Roman Empire as empress and regent of her son and she had always secretly kept the practice of revering holy icons. Throughout the persecutions of the church which had taken place under the iconoclast emperors, the popes had remained steadfast in their position against iconoclasm. That position was that there was a difference between using an icon to help remember and revere Jesus or a saint and worshipping an idol, and that the first was acceptable, the second not. Soon, it was suggested that Empress Irene should deal with the iconoclast matter once and for all through a general council of the church, so with the help of the pope, that's what they did. The council itself began in 787 AD with the intention of dealing with the iconoclast issue, and issued a few anathemas and quite a number of new canons as well. The anathemas established that Jesus could be represented in his humanity, that artistic representation of scenes from the Gospels should be accepted, that representations of Jesus and the saints should be revered, and that the traditions of the Church, both written and otherwise, should never be rejected. This addressed all the major errors of the iconoclast, though, of course, it would be some time before the movement itself ended, and even after it did, other iconoclast movements would occur at other points in history further down the road. A number of canons were included in this council as well, judging that bishops would need to have knowledge of the Psalms and the will to learn the faith, that anyone who's made a bishop through the influence of worldly leaders should be suspended, and that only bishops should elect bishops. They should never use their positions or authority to accumulate wealth for themselves from those under them, nor should they close off holy churches, preventing the liturgies from being celebrated in them while expressing frustration or anger with things they can't sense. Using money to purchase positions and ordinations in the church was forbidden. The requirement for synods to be held to resolve issues was reduced from two a year to a minimum of one, and any worldly ruler who interfered with those synods being held was to be banned from the church, excommunicated. The use of the relics of martyrs in consecrating churches was restored. This was a practice that the iconoclasts hadn't followed, despite a large number of martyrs that they'd had and any churches that had been consecrated without relics were to have relics installed. In the future, bishops consecrating without relics should be deposed. A bunch of practitioners of Judaism had at this time started pretending to be Christians to infiltrate Christian society, all while continuing to carry on the practices of their old Jewish religion. The council decided that if they weren't going to actually become Christians, they should go back to their Jewish faith and not be welcomed into Christian churches alongside actual Jewish converts. Writings containing the false teachings of the iconoclasts were expected to be turned in at a building in Constantinople so they could be put with any other heretical texts, and bishops and other officials in the church were forbidden from giving away or selling the church's farmland to worldly rulers. The land could be given to clerics or workers, but not to rulers, even if the rulers tried to buy land using a cleric or worker as an intermediary. People who, in the past, had seized church property to turn it into private businesses for themselves were to be suspended or excommunicated if they didn't return it voluntarily. Some people had started shaving the tops of their heads like clerics and reading at the podium at Mass despite not having been ordained to do either of those things, and the council decided that that should be stopped, along with the wearing of showy, impressive clothes by priests. 
People who don't have what it takes to start up houses of prayer should be stopped from doing so by the local bishops, but people who do have the resources can go right ahead. Monasteries containing both monks and nuns were also banned. A few other warnings were also given about how to remain virtuous and avoid temptations. Apart from these things, the council mostly reaffirmed things that had been established in previous councils. Also, it's worth noting that some sources online incorrectly say that this council dealt with the issue of adoptionism. It didn't. That was the First Council of Nicaea. Next, the Fourth Council of Constantinople. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.